Welcome back to another video. In this one I want to cover Nick Batia's excellent book Layered Money which came out this year and I actually have it right here. And in the book he walks us from gold and dollars to Bitcoin and central bank digital currencies. So we first dive into a bit of history to understand how money is layered already and why Bitcoin is built on a very similar construct. The easiest way to understand layered money are gold and gold certificates from 1928. Gold is held in central banks and gold certificates are used for easier payment and they can be exchanged with each other. In this case, gold is the first layer money and the certificates are the second layer money. Nick built the layers in a way so that the first layer is always the one on the top, in this example gold, and new layers are added from there. The gold certificates made out of paper are just a representation of an exact amount of gold. This is also the distinction between money and currency. Gold is money, the second layer paper certificates are currency. With it comes counterparty risk. All second layer monies are IOUs, or promises to pay first layer money. They all have something called counterparty risk. Trust in counterparties is required for our financial system to operate, or else we'd all still be using gold and silver coins for every single transaction. Here we can also make the first Bitcoin comparison. Bitcoin as a base layer is free of this counterparty risk. But back to our monetary history. What happened is that first layer money emerged as a better way to store value over longer periods of time, and second layer money emerged as a better way to transact, because it was more flexible to use than coinage. However, there were always actors that tried and sometimes successfully tried to monopolize the issuance of second layer money by owning all the first layer money. In 1609, for example, the Bank of Amsterdam's first order of business was to outlaw cashiers and their notes and mandate all gold and silver coins throughout the city be deposited at the bank. The Bank of Amsterdam was able to successfully monopolize the issuance of second layer money by eliminating public access to the first layer money. By suspending convertibility to first layer money, the Bank of Amsterdam proved that precious metals wasn't necessarily required to operate a monetary and financial system. But one thing became clear later on. Gold is money, everything else is credit. JP Morgan to United States Congress in 1912. Keeping that in mind, it's quite astounding what happened to the Federal Reserve, the US Central Bank. Gold represented 84% of the Federal Reserve's assets upon its founding. Today, for reference, gold represents less than 1% of the Fed's assets. Gold was replaced by US Treasuries as the first layer. Remember, gold is money, everything else is credit. In 1933, Roosevelt ordered what the Bank of Amsterdam ordered 300 years earlier. Executive Order 6102 instructed all gold coin, gold bullion and certificates to be delivered to the government. Thereby eliminating people from first layer money, making it illegal with up to 10 years in prison. So at this point, the pyramid basically had gold and US treasuries at the top, followed by the US dollar and second layer money. But what about other currencies? Amidst the global currency war, the dollar emerged as the cleanest, dirty shirt in the laundry of global currencies. The US dollar became the world reserve currency and through the Bretton Woods agreement in 1944, every other currency was now third layer money. However, the Bretton Woods system failed because nations depleted the gold reserves of the Fed and the Fed kept printing dollars without any established reserve ratio. Me and also Nick just wanted to run you through a little bit of history to show that layered money is not a new concept. It's not something that came new with Bitcoin, it's something we historically always had. Historically and also currently, we have a layered system with US and other treasuries and gold held by central banks at the top, followed by payment rails like Fedwire and ACH, and then on the fourth layer or so we have the transactional layers that we all use, like credit cards and PayPal. The point that I want to make here is that the base layer of a monetary system is usually not the layer with the fastest transaction speeds. Quite the opposite, the base layer offers a final settlement. You can assume Bitcoin transactions to be final after about an hour, and that on a global scale. It's by far the fastest global final settlement we ever had. Not being able to buy coffee with Bitcoin is something that critics usually like to state to prove that Bitcoin has no use case. And yeah, to be honest, recording a coffee transaction on tens of thousands of nodes around the world is not really the prime example for why a decentralized, censorship-resistant money makes sense. This has led to widely used, albeit misinformed, criticism of Bitcoin. The network is too slow to function properly as a medium of commerce. In reality, first layer Bitcoin transactions are not designed for instant commerce. They are designed to keep an entire global network of peers in perpetual agreement on the status of the Bitcoin ledger. As we previously learned, the base layer of a monetary system is usually good for storing value and not for a medium of exchange. This is also why comparing Bitcoin to credit cards is utterly useless. Credit cards are actually much slower when it comes to the final settlement of transactions. They just offer credit with a counterparty risk in the meantime. A merchant trusts his customers that the credit card transaction will eventually settle, but it's not instant at all. 
how Fini, the first recipient of a Bitcoin transactions, knew that Bitcoin will be layered very early on. Bitcoin itself cannot scale to have every single financial transaction in the world be broadcast to everyone and included in the blockchain. There needs to be a secondary level of payment systems which is lighter weight and more efficient. This is where things like the Lightning Network come into play that allow instant and worldwide transactions at pretty much zero cost and can scale to millions of transactions per second, much more than Visa for example. I must say though that I'm still a little bit of a Lightning skeptic. I think it's the best scaling option we currently have that doesn't compromise the decentralization and security of the base layer. However, it has a user experience problem in my eyes, as opening channels and filling them with liquidity before actually using them is super counterintuitive. We will see if there will be another layer on top that fixes this somehow. Also, Lightning is still missing a bit of a killer app, which is something that could potentially change with Strike Global. But as I said, I believe it's still the best scaling option available and much better than aiming to settle every micropayment on the base layer like some cryptocurrencies want to. I'm curious about your opinion on this, so let me know what you think about this whole scaling and medium of exchange topic. Now, back to our layered money system. Nick makes the point that you can also think of alternative cryptocurrencies as part of the layered system, because they have a price relationship with Bitcoin. So, similar to the Bretton Woods system, you could think of Bitcoin acting as the base price for other digital currencies. And the layered system of Bitcoin is actually wider than that already. You have exchanges and trusts that offer a second layer Bitcoin while they keep the keys, you have stable coins that reflect the value of fiat currencies like the US dollar, and at some point central bank digital currencies. The plain truth about Bitcoin is that nobody controls it. It has become the first ever government-free, universally accessible digital currency. And for these reasons, all currencies in the purely digital realm will face price discovery in BTC terms. This means that all digital currencies, from cryptocurrencies to central bank digital currencies, will be measured in BTC, just like the Bretton Woods Agreement in 1944 mandated all currencies be measured in USD. The layer pyramid is actually much more complex by now and we can only guess what layers will be added in a world in which money is now software. I hope you enjoyed the video and learned something from it. I can highly recommend Nick's book, so check it out. And as I said, I'm curious about what you think about this layered concept. Is this something you find promising, especially Lightning for example, is this promising to you? Or would you rather have a base layer that does everything? That's it from my side. Thank you for watching. I would appreciate it if you leave a like and subscribe to the channel and then I see you next time.